Hear these words from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 35. Even the wilderness and desert will be glad in those days. The wasteland will rejoice and blossom with spring crocuses. Yes, there will be an abundance of flowers and singing and joy. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return. They shall come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads, and they shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The third week of Advent, we remember the gift of joy we have in Christ. We remember the joy that Mary felt when the angel Gabriel told her that a special child would be born to her, a child who would save and deliver all people. Joy is the gift we all receive from the unconditional love Christ has for us. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the joy you bring us. Help us prepare our hearts for the Lord's coming by helping us see that Christ came for every person we meet wherever we go. We ask this in the name of the one born in Bethlehem, Jesus our Lord. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I will say rejoice. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O people of God, and shout for joy all who are upright in heart. Why should we rejoice? The world has become a dark and threatening place. Enemies surround us. Disaster lurks at every corner. There is no justice. There is no peace. The Lord is near. Let all who take refuge in the Lord rejoice. Let all who hope for deliverance sing for joy. The Lord is near. Why should we sing? We are often discouraged and weighed down by our own failures. Sometimes we are overly confident in our own ability to change. We long for your renewing presence among us. Rejoice, for the Lord is near. The Lord has turned away our enemies. He has taken away the judgments against us. The Lord will make known his victory. He will reveal his vindication in the sight of all people. O Lord, spread your protection over us, so that those who love your name may exalt in you. Remind us that you have already defeated the powers of darkness. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within us. The Lord our God is in our midst. He will gather the outcast. He will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. He will renew us in his love. We sing to the Lord because he loves us. We rejoice for the Lord is near. Surely he is coming soon. Come, Lord Jesus. 
I wanted to take a moment to say thank you for those who have sent in pledge cards or have made a commitment online. Today, we have had nearly 200 uh, families and individuals make a commitment to our ministry budget for the coming year. This helps us so much in planning of how, how we're doing ministry and mission in 2022. Thank you. Will you join me in our prayer for illumination? God of all peace and joy, send your spirit to this place to bless this, our reading of your word, that it may be a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, and I'll be reading from chapter 3, verses 7 through 18. And this morning we are reading from the New Revised Standard Version. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by, all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. 
His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Perhaps by now you are checking to see if you clicked on the right link for online worship or wondering if you're watching a rerun of Rejoice. Is this the scripture for December 12th? 13 days before Christmas? This is the third Sunday of Advent, right? And we're hearing John the Baptist? Yes, you are on the right place. We are on the right page. This is the reading for today. Every year in the season of Advent, our gospel readings give us two weeks of John the Baptist. And last week we had what I would call a pleasant introduction to him but this week we hear his message. How many of you have received a Christmas card with a picture of John the Baptist on the front and inside it says, Merry Christmas, you brood of vipers? <laughs> no, no, I haven't either. The Grinch and even Bad Santa have made it to the front of a Christmas card, but not John the Baptist. We do long for the Christmas story. That is part of the tension of Advent. We want baby Jesus, but are having to wait for the Messiah. We don't want John the Baptist. We want the manger. The very next verses in Luke's gospel is the story of Jesus coming, grown up Jesus, to be baptized. It may not be your favorite movie or the most tastefully done movie, but I can't help but hear the character Ricky Bobby and Talladega Knights sitting at the head of the family table preparing to offer grace before his family eats. And he bows his head, closes his eyes, folds his hand and prays, Dear eight pound, six ounce newborn baby Jesus, don't even know a word yet, just a little infant, so cuddly but still omnipotent. It would be tempting to skip over this gospel reading for today. The epistle reading is from Philippians chapter four. Rejoice in the Lord always. That would have been happier. But we will be faithful to the season and admit that on this third Sunday of Advent, when we talk about joy, we know that joy is not just about giddiness. It is about the relationship and freedom God invites us to. And just past the brood of vipers comment, John does get a little dramatic with his language, but just past that, there is a message of joy. Eventually, there is joy. We do adore the baby Jesus, and not just because he is cuddly as Ricky Bobby describes him, but we are amazed that God has worked through ordinary people Mary and Joseph who find themselves in very difficult circumstances. Jesus is born into poverty, well, at least into a working poor family. His birth is first announced to shepherds who are beyond the margins of society. This is important to us. We hear a baby's cry and think, this is God? This is God. And we would like to jump from there to the end of the story with the risen Christ and say, this is God. But John the Baptist calls us on this third Sunday of Advent of hoping and longing to remind us who God is and what God requires of us and what God offers us. The good news, the joy, is that we are all invited to the kingdom of God. It does not matter if you are children of Abraham, as John the Baptist says. It doesn't matter if you're a member of this church or your great granddaddy was a preacher or your family gives the most money to the church. Or the, uh, it's about, not about any of these outward attributes or proclamations of power or loyalties to lineage or connections to group. John says, that doesn't matter. Hear how Eugene Peterson translates this passage in the message. He says, when crowds of people came out for baptism because it was the popular thing to do, John exploded. Brood of snakes, what do you think you're doing slithering down here to the river? 
Do you think a little water on your snake skins is going to deflect God's judgment? It's your life that must change, not your skin. And don't you think you can pull rank by claiming Abraham as father? Being a child of Abraham is neither here nor there. Children of Abraham are a dime a dozen. God can make children from stones if he wants. What counts is your life. Is it green and flourishing? Because if it's dead wood, it goes on the fire. I love that image, imagery that he talks about our life being green and flourishing, uh, whereas our traditional reading says bearing fruit. Well, after this outburst, the crowd asked John, well, what are we supposed to do? And John the Baptist repeats words that we have heard from Old Testament prophets about justice and what we will hear Jesus speak later. What are we supposed to do? If you have two coats, give one of them to someone who is cold. If you see someone hungry, give them something to eat. The tax collectors who were there said, well, what about us? What do we do? Don't extort people. Do what is right. Don't take more money than what is legal. The soldiers who were there asked, well, what about us? What do we do? The soldiers who were assigned to keep the peace of Rome in the community John said, no more harassment, no more blackmail, and be content with your rations. These are words that even Ricky Bobby could understand. More importantly, they are words that you and I understand. But sometimes we want our faith to be more complicated or just about believing the right thing or saying the right thing. But baby Jesus and grown-up Jesus and teaching Jesus, and crucified Jesus, and risen Jesus, all call us to change our hearts and give ourselves over to the kingdom. We are invited into relationship with God and with God's community. That means there is accountability, there is trust, there are expectations, and when we break that relationship, there are consequences, not punishment. We hear fire and think punishment, but God is always working to restore, to refine, renew, and make right. That's what the word judgment and justice and righteousness mean. We are told in John's gospel that Christ came not to condemn the world, but to save, restore, heal the world. There is an Episcopal priest and theologian and a brilliant writer named Fleming Rutledge who has helped me understand the word judgment separate from the word judgmental and punishment. Judgment is not about punishment. Remember, Jesus came to save, not to condemn. Rutledge says... The concept of justice is indeed central to the biblical portrait of the God who has revealed himself in the written word and in the incarnate word who is his son. She says justice cannot be reduced to just being involved in an issue like capital punishment or immigration, as important as that is, but all justice must be referenced first to the righteousness of God. A key to the biblical meaning of justice is found in the fact that the word translated justice and righteousness is the same word in Hebrew and Greek. The root of the word becomes both a noun and a verb, so that justice or judgment is the same thing as righteousness or rectification, making things right. The Christian hope is founded in the promise of God that all things will be made new according to God's righteousness. All the references to judgment in the Bible should be understood in the context of God's righteousness. Not just his being righteous, noun, but his making right, verb, all that has been wrong. John the Baptist invites us in rather urgent and graphic language to participate in God's righteousness, making things right. He says that Jesus will bring a winnowing fork. Now, if you are like me and did not grow up on a farm, you need a glossary of farm implements. <laughs> so let me help you here. 
a pitchfork, which we all associate with those cartoons of devils. A pitchfork is used to stab at a pile of hay and move it or toss it from one place to another. A winnowing fork, think of a basket with a, a, a loosely woven basket. I'm familiar with strainers and colanders in the kitchen. Think of a strainer made of reeds. Do you have a picture in your mind now? How about panning for gold? The important thing is the winnowing fork is a sifting, letting go of what is useless or harmful or what is in the way so that what is good and useful can be set aside. The scripture does not say that Jesus will bring a sledgehammer, <laughs> but a winnowing fork, a sifter, that is indeed good news. I am given clear instructions by John the Baptist of what is expected of me. Produce fruit by the power of God. What is inside my heart can be changed. The chaff, the hate, the fear, the superiority, the prejudice, the apathy. You can name the things that are in your heart. Those can be shaken out through the winnowing fork and God's righteousness, our wanting to make things right, our wanting to be in a right relationship with God and others is what remains. Again, this is how Eugene Peterson puts it. John the Baptist says that Jesus will ignite the kingdom of life, the, the kingdom life, a fire, the Holy Spirit within you, changing you from the inside out. He's going to clean house, make a clean sweep of your lives. He'll place everything true in its proper place before God. Everything false, he'll put out with the trash to be burned. Won't it feel good to be free of all of that? To know that Jesus holds my heart, our hearts, the world's heart in his hands and he sifts all that is unnecessary. And then Jesus discards all of that, all that is not fruitful for his kingdom, so that you and I may indeed bear good fruit and be witnesses. That is indeed good news. That is cause for rejoicing. Amen. Having heard the word read and proclaimed, let us join together in affirming our faith. We believe that God has come to us, that God brought us into being, that this God gave us breath and purpose, that we have been blessed to be a blessing to others, that we have fallen short of this commandment, but that God has nevertheless loved us despite our brokenness. We believe that God is coming to us, that God is not happy to leave us alone, that this God will come to us as a particular human being, that God will be made known to us in flesh and bone like ours, that Mary will soon give birth and Joseph will soon clap his hands in joy that Jesus Christ will be born and our salvation made complete. We believe that God will come to us, that God will have the final word and that word will be good, that this God will give us the presence of the Spirit to continue our work, that we are called to be disciples to all the corners of the earth, that the day is coming when tears and pain will be no more and all will gather at the table to sing an endless and perfect Alleluia.
And now as people who have had their hearts held in the hands of Christ and have had all that is unnecessary sifted out, I pray that you know full well the love of Almighty God, the grace of our Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now, throughout this season of Advent, and for always. Amen.